Peter Bedalant, I'm the principal here at Concord Carlisle High School, and I have the distinct honor of introducing our speakers this evening. Um, before I do, I have a, a, a personal story to share with you regarding tonight's presentation. Uh, just over 25 years ago, I uh, played lacrosse uh, for Brookline High, and I was playing in a game against Concord Carlisle uh, on the field right behind the student parking lot, or the one that's right <coughs> next to the student parking lot. Um, and it, during, one of the, during the game, um, I actually got hit so hard that I fell backwards and uh, hit my head on the ground. Um, I never blacked out, but everything got very fuzzy and I felt sick to my stomach for quite some time. Um, not wanting to lose any playing time, I got up and never said anything to my coach. I basically shook it off. And uh, well, my experience was nowhere near as traumatic as what many other players go through. I think my reaction was fairly common, a fairly common one among our young athletes. Uh, don't say anything if you're hurt, as you might not get to play as much. Um, in all likelihood, I may well have suffered a concussion on that day, but didn't have the wherewithal to tell anybody about it. So I think, again, my, my own experience is one that's fairly, um, it's fairly common among our, our athletes. Um, uh, more, uh, more importantly, I want to thank the Concord Carlisle Parents Initiative for making this evening possible. They've been working tirelessly over the past month, few months to bring, this, bring the, uh, Dr. Cantu and James Arrigo to uh, Concord Carlisle for this, not only for this evening, but also for tomorrow, because they'll be speaking to all of our students uh, during presentations tomorrow uh, in school. Uh, and again, it's my hope in CCPIs that, by, that we're raising awareness about the seriousness of head injuries, and that we can create more discussions about it both here tonight in homes and in the community. We're hoping that a lot of the students, when they hear the message tomorrow, can go home and bring that message to the dinner table and make it part of a discussion um, in the homes. Uh, before you go this evening, uh, I just want to, and before I introduce our speakers, I want to point out that there's a packet that was near the front door. Hopefully you grabbed one on the way in. If you didn't, um, please grab one uh, at some point before you go tonight, because on the very last page is uh, an evaluation uh, tool. And this is a, an important piece that if you please fill it out before you leave this evening and leave it at the table near the front door, um, it, helps, it helps CCPI in terms of its programming and also in terms of maintaining um, grant funding as well for certain programs. Uh, but now I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our speakers. We have two this evening. Dr. Cantu, um, currently Dr. Cantu's professional responsibility include those of Chief of Neurosurgery, Neurosurgery Services, Chairman, Chairman, excuse me, Chairman Department of Surgery, and Director of Sports Medicine at Emerson Hospital here in Concord, Adjunct Professor of Exercise and Sports Science at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Co-Director of Neurological Sports <coughs> Injury Center at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, and a neurosurgical consultant for the Boston Eagles football team, a neurosurgical consultant for the Boston Cannons professional soccer team. He served as a consultant to many scholastic and professional athletes on their return to collision sports after head injury or spine injury, and is active speaking on a variety of health-related interests, including the overall benefits of moderate regular exercise, the special health and exercise concerns of senior citizens, and sports safety issues with high school athletic trainers, coaches, students, and parents. He currently serves as the neurological, as I just said, the neurosurgical consultant for the Boston College Eagles football team as well as to the Boston Cannons. He was recently asked by the NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell to give two presentations at the NFL's concussion meeting in Chicago. Practicing what he preaches, Dr. Cantu has enjoyed long distance running since 1967 um, and has been an official entrant in the Boston Marathon several times. Um, besides uh, running, Dr. Cantu is a serious tennis player and for many years has been ranked as a men's sing senior singles player here in the region. Um, and Dr. Cantu uh, has two children, Robert and Elizabeth, and lives in, with his wife, Tina, in Lincoln, Massachusetts, nearby. James Arrigo, to his right, is a junior at Austin Prep. James um, has, was a member, has been a member of the varsity lacrosse team since his freshman year. He's a member of JV basketball and track and field. He's a National Honor Society member, school vice president, one of two ambassadors to the MIAA, that's the Massachusetts Interscholastic Athletic Association, representing Austin and active in the community. James recently spoke on a panel of brain injury survivors at the 2007 Youth Concussion Conference sponsored by the Massachusetts Brain Injury Association and at Austin and at Woburn High School with Dr. Cantu. His personal experience with severe post-concussion syndrome has raised his commitment to make a difference with concussion awareness. And with that, I now give you Dr. Cantu. Uh, <laughs> hey, Dr. Cantu. Dr. Cantu, I think Thank you. Thank you um, very much, Peter, for the introduction. We're going to start with Jimmy tonight. He's oh. going to kind of set the table, That's right. and then we're going to kind of run with it a little bit. All right. James Arrigo, front and center. Okay. Thank you.
All right, hi everybody. Uh, my name is James Arrigo, uh, and like you like you said, um, I'm a junior at Austin Prep, and I'm mainly here tonight to help raise awareness about concussions, and basically to share my own story to help you guys get a better insight about, you know, personality and like personal concussion stories. So, um, if you look at me, you know, I look fine, right? I look okay, everybody. Yeah, okay. Well, um, you'd never guess what I've been through the past six or seven months. No matter what sport you play, you know, there's always the risk of injury, whether it's um, broken bone, dislocated shoulder, or even a sprained ankle. These are all injuries that you can see. Concussions, however, happen all the time, but you, you can never tell when somebody has one because there's no cast, band-aid, or even wrap to show that you have one. Whenever you usually talk about concussions, it's usually, oh, uh, it's no big deal, toughen up, or it's just a concussion. I personally thought that you had to pass out or throw up or black out, like you said, um, to even have a concussion. So it shows you how, you know, we didn't know too much about it. I've tried and played just about every sport my whole life, and um, I would never think that my life would have changed from a sport, either good or bad, um, especially lacrosse. I've been playing lacrosse since the fourth grade back in Virginia. Um, and I made varsity as a freshman, like you said, and um, Lacrosse was more than just a sport, it was more like a release or uh, gave me a sense of identity at my own school and um, you know I couldn't wait every season to play. But on May 12th um, everything kind of changed. Um, it was during a varsity lacrosse game against one of our rivals Arlington Catholic and um, the game just started getting real rough. Um, the other team started taking out some of our key players and I guess I turned out to be one of them. On the play that kind of changed my life, uh, it first started with the ball having to roll out of bounds and the play is supposed to stop. But um, I guess the kid didn't get the memo or something. But uh, I turn around and um, he was waiting for me right there and he cross checked me to the throat and um, it had so much force behind it that it lifted me up in the air and I smashed my head off the ground. Uh, this was the first concussion. Now I didn't know what a concussion was, so I just remember laying there on the ground saying, Okay, um, everything's spinning. I don't know what's going on, um, but I guess I'm fine. Uh, just a little nick. So by the time I stumbled to my feet, um, the play had already con the play kept on going, and my luck, I guess, the ball ended up rolling by me, and everyone's screaming, "James, get the ball, Arigo, pick it up, score!" You know. So I end up going, just listening to everybody, uh, and I pick it up. I run over. I end up getting the assisting goal within, uh, you know, right away. So now I'm all pumped up with you know adrenaline because I just scored this uh, I just got this assisting goal and I don't really even know what's going on so I turn around to give my teammate a high five and um, instead of my teammate it was the same kid who hit me the first time and uh, with his fist in the shaft of his stick he ends up hitting me on the side of the head and with such force it just snapped my neck and uh, this time I went right down I lost all feeling um, in my legs hands my chest felt like it was deflating um, just constant confusion, a pounding headache, and I had no clue what was going on. Uh, I, by the time I got to my feet and just started wobbling around, the play kept on going and nobody saw me get hurt. So I just remember just stumbling over to the field and um, the only reaction I got from everybody was kind of yelling at me, what are you doing off the side of the field? Get, get back in the game. Um, you you need, to, uh, need to get back in. We need you. So uh, luckily I knew enough. Um, about, you know, I, I could barely walk. Luckily I knew something was, wasn't up and um, I stayed out. Now while I'm on the bench though, all these weird symptoms started happening. Like uh, I would be really dizzy, like I said. Um, my chest was deflating. Weird emotions, like I'd be dizzy one minute and then angry and then happy and then laughing. And everyone probably thought I was nuts, but no one understood concussions or that I had two concussions. If I had gone back in, for a third concussion, um, I might not have been here tonight. I suffered what's called severe post-concussion syndrome because I had two concussions back to back within like a few minutes of each other. I ended up going to the emergency room after the game and the doctor ended up telling me that, oh yeah, you're okay, uh, you just have a neck sprain. Now I didn't know what concussions were and neither did my family so we just believed the doctor and followed his orders. and. He ended up telling me that I could play lacrosse on Monday. 
So now by Monday, uh, it's just a constant fog. Um, I'm in school, I'm trying to do simple math, which seems like calculus now, and I'm counting on my fingers for addition and subtraction, and um, it's just really, real confusion, and I didn't know what was going on. Um, now, as the days went on, as the week went on, um, I ended up getting worse. My symptoms got much, uh, much more severe, and um, by Friday, I was in Dr. Cantu's office uh, checking off a long list of symptoms. Um, when I was checking off the symptoms, now I could put words to what I was feeling. It really hit me because I'm sitting here looking at this list of 25 symptoms and I'm checking off almost all of them. Depression, yeah, I have that. Uh, hearing loss, yeah, okay. And that's when it really hit me because I had no clue. Um, I couldn't do simple math. Like I said, adding subtraction seemed like calculus to me, counting on my fingers. My personality completely changed. Um, I couldn't read well, and I suffered severe depression. Now I'm a happy kid. I don't know if any of you know me yet, but I'm a really happy-go-lucky guy. And to have severe depression hitting me, um, I don't know, that just really scared me. And I was like, okay, i got to snap out of this now. This, isn't, this is not a joking matter. Now besides just these side effects that I was suffering with, most kids with concussions, you end up dealing with you know, the students and the, the kids in your school. I was dealing with, you know, the constant jokes, and, you know, sometimes they're funny, but after a while it ends up getting to you. And um, it really, they start the jokes because no one really understands it. The people who don't have a concussion, they don't understand that, um, what you're going through. And they're like, they'd be asking me, well, why, why can't you talk to me? And my speech is slurred, and they laugh at me and stuff like that. But the people that do have concussions and, like, you know, the real tough guys, uh, I noticed that I'd, they'd ask me, well, what's the matter with you? And I'd be like, well, I, I had a really bad concussion. And they'd be like, oh, concussion? That's it? Uh, that's not bad. I've had, you know, six or seven concussions. That's when I'm hearing this. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Why doesn't anybody take this as seriously as it should? Because this is your brain you're playing around with. You're not playing with your broken arm or anything. So it's, it's taken me about um, seven months to get rid of most of my symptoms. Uh, I could never play lacrosse or any contact sports again. And um, if I had known what to do, if I, if I went to one of these lectures like this and I heard about concussions and understood some of the side effects, um, I wouldn't have been in such bad shape as I am, you know. Um, concussions, my main point is concussions shouldn't be taken as lightly as they are. Um, they're, they're not just an injury or a scrape, they're a brain injury no matter what. And um, there needs to be a lot more awareness about you know, concussions to the players, coaches, staff, and teachers, and, and the parents, because if I didn't have um, the parents' you know, help, then I wouldn't have been you know, in the place where I was today. Um, and yeah, I guess that's, I don't know, it's tough to talk to everybody because I am not a public speaker. I am not a fan of any of this, but this is something that I feel so strongly about, and concussions are so serious that, um, you know, I feel that I have to talk in front of this crowd. And let me tell you, before I came here, I was nervous as anything. But, um, so that's my presentation, but uh, thank you for listening, and I hope it helps a little bit. So thank you. Yeah, you're nervous. Matt Damon's ugly. I know. I know. <laughs> the... Um, Excellent job, and Jimmy's going to take your questions at the end when we're going to kind of reserve it for that. Seeing the mixture that's out there tonight, I, I kind of realize the majority of you aren't docs, and I'm glad to see some are. Um, this lecture largely was presented, actually was presented this, this Monday um, in at Boston University for Grand Rounds, and so I'm going to go through a lot of it um, in terms of the different slides very quickly and just try to make some cogent points as we go show a few videos that I think are useful to make points that hopefully you'll remember because you'll maybe associate it with a video. First of all, I think it's really important that we all understand that there's an explosion of information about concussion in the press, yes, over the last couple of years Start of some of it pioneered by Brooke DeLynch, who's sitting over here to my left. Um, but even in the medical literature, since the year 2000, in peer-reviewed journals, there's been more written about concussion than ever written before the year 2000. 
So those of us who have been working in the field for quite a while are really thrilled about the explosion of new research that's coming down the pike and the government is funding it, uh, recognizing the importance of it. And this has been even heightened in the last couple of years with the blast injury issues coming out of Iraq and so on. But every time we see something happen currently, we often forget that people have kind of thought about these issues a long time, and some people are really far ahead of their time. This is a quote from a team physician. In case any man in any game got hurt by a hit on the head so they did not realize what he was doing, his teammate should at once insist that time be called and a doctor come onto the field to see what is the trouble. Also that every man on the squad must make up his mind in case he gets hurt to have a friend with him from time of injury occurred until noon the next day to prevent any serious results from beginning without anybody being around. Pretty sage words. How many of you think that was written in the last 25 years? Don't raise your hand, I kind of gave you a hint, it's not. <laughs> but in the last 50, 75, 100, come on, 100 years? Wrong. Amazing, team physician, Harvard football, 1905, James Nichols, amazing mechanism for catastrophic brain injuries in football is helmet-to-helmet -helmet collision. The player that's most at risk in a typical helmet-to-helmet -helmet contact is the player that doesn't see the hit coming. Now, in the interest, well, in the ball, interest of time, I'm going to stop the video and we're not going to go forward with that, but point number one I want to make is I hope I live long enough to see that hit eliminated from football. It's not necessary to allow helmet-to-helmet -helmet deliberate contact in football. It can be outlawed, it should be outlawed. The NFL has gone on record recently as outlawing flagrant helmet-to-helmet -hel -helmet collisions, the kind the announcers love to talk about ad nauseum. And this past Saturday, a Stanford quarterback just about had his head taken off. I don't know whether any of you saw that from a very flagrant hit that, thank God, it was only a concussion that the kid had. Those kinds of hits don't have to be a part of football. I think there'll be a day when we will see them eliminated. With regard to football and other sports too, they may, you, you may argue, some may argue, well, you have to have those helmet-to-helmet -helmet hits because without them, the sport wouldn't be as popular as it is. Well, NASCAR is running around in boxy cars that are a hell of a lot safer than the ones that killed Dale Earnhardt. And it's at an all-time popularity. And Michigan sold out long before they even had face masks on helmets. So I'm sure you can take away that kind of a hit and, and not destroy the popularity of football, which is a great sport. Some misconceptions about concussions is obviously they don't just occur in contact collision sports. They occur in any sport, but the collision sports, football, ice hockey, lacrosse, uh, much more common. Soccer, the incidence is every bit as high as it is in football, at least recognize concussions. And I'll, I'll get back to that. Uh, in just a second. With regard to girls and concussions, I hope this video will make you think long and hard about your daughter. Every year, kids between the ages of 5 and 18 experience about 135,000 sports-related traumatic brain injuries. And a new study says that when it comes to concussions, girls are particularly vulnerable. In high school soccer, girls were 64% more likely to sustain a concussion, usually from falling while trying to head the ball. In basketball, girls were 300% more likely to get a concussion. The fact that women don't have necks as
well developed as men so that the shock absorber, so to speak, is not as well developed in the women. And women may just be a bit more honest than men in terms of honestly admitting that they've had post-concussion symptoms. According to the CDC, sports are second only to car accidents as they which have come out, which have duplicated at the high school level what the NC2A has been publishing for years, and that is in the same sports that women and men play, boys and girls play, for instance, basketball, soccer. In each case, the incidence of concussion is higher in the women as compared with the men. And the actual explanations for that we're not really sure of, the leading theories are, yes, there are hormonal differences. The young ladies do not generally speak, generally do not work on their neck muscles the way that uh, boys and men tend to do in their sports. And then again, there's the issue of trying to play through an injury. As we heard Peter say, introducing everything. It's in the culture of certain sports to try to shrug it off and play right through. And yes, some women mistakenly and girls try to do this too, but generally speaking, the women are probably a bit more honest. In terms of who's at greatest risk for concussion, mild traumatic brain injury, it's the individuals peaking around the 15 to 16 year age group. You obviously can have concussions before then, you obviously can have them after, but those are the age groups where the incidence of concussion is the highest. It's also at an age group where we worry about it the most too. The brain is developing, it's plastic in the teen years, and an injury at that stage can have more profound effects uh, than an injury of a similar degree uh, when an individual is an adult. In terms of the helmets that are on our athletes, football helmets are all NOXI certified. They're all certified to a severity index standard of 1200, which correlates to about a, um, a four-fold higher level of energy attenuation than you'd have to have to prevent concussions. If you're going to prevent most concussions, you're going to have to get under a g-force of 100 or a severity index, another way of calculating the same thing, of 300. The helmets are made to a standard of 1200. They do a perfect job of preventing skull fractures, which is what they're designed to do. They do a great job of preventing most, but not all, subdural hematomas, but they don't do a very good job of preventing concussion. But they're not made to a standard to do that. There's one helmet that recently has come on the market. Some of you may have seen the front page New York Times article. It's kind of an interesting story. It's a local Harvard quarterback who held all the records uh, up until a few years ago, Vin Ferrer is his name, and he came up with this new concept um, of using basically air cells, compressible air cells, kind of like bubble wrap that communicates with itself. Or those of you that know truck and the air ride shock absorber, it's kind of the same theory, only put them in helmets, and so basically each of these are air cells that are inside the football helmet and become the energy attenuating uh, substance. Here is a single one. And if you squeeze it slowly, the air goes out of it slowly. If you hit it really hard, it becomes very stiff as the air can't get out that fast. And so it works across the whole spectrum uh, of uh, forces attenuating and it has tested out to be far better than any other helmet design and actually is the only new concept that's come down the pike in the last 30 years. Uh, for us tonight, this isn't so important about the physics, but it also greatly uh, lengthens out the, the milliseconds over which the energy is attenuated. That's, that gives it a much greater safety factor. And I won't go through a lot of the math and uh, so on. In terms of what causes helmet, I mean, what causes concussion, it's collision with an opponent, and it's almost always head collisions. In soccer, most of the concussions are incurred heading the ball 
but not touching the ball, hitting somebody else's head with your head. So the incidence of concussion in soccer is 10%. The incidence of concussion in football, uh, depending upon how you look at it, is under 10%. Um, most of the time, it's contact head to head. It's a mistake when it happens in soccer. Um, contact with another body part is the next most common uh, situation. Contact with the ground or the field itself uh, are, are less common causes uh, for concussion. If you're going to prevent concussion, probably the most important thing you can do is learn proper technique. And proper technique in football is not using the head as a battering ram, not using the helmet as a weapon, not using the helmet as the initial point in, of contact except when it's accidental. Other things you can do to help have a w very well-developed shock absorber system, which is basically your neck musculature. And if you're going to play a contact collision sport, um, our sons and daughters should be working hard on their neck muscles to be as strong as they can be. Obviously, if you're in a, a sport that is helmeted, the helmet should fit properly. Being very well hydrated is necessary as well. The dehydrated brain um, is shrunken. It can be shaken more violently, have greater excursion inside the skull. Probably that's playing a role in some concussions. Genetics is also something that we can't really pick and choose on, but definitely some people are more easily concussed than others. And if you have a bad shake that way, um, you may want to go into a sport where head trauma is not uh, a part of the sport. And then, of course, luck, because there are some concussions which can't be avoided. Somebody makes a proper tackle but catches the knee in the chin or catches a foot in the head in soccer, whatever. Uh, so luck does play some role. Um, it's kind of fun that those of us that have been working in the field for decades have been preaching to a medical choir and then in the last year or two, uh, Brooke DeLench and then more recently Chris uh, Nowinski have brought out um, books which have um, been developed for the lay public. And Chris's book is filled with individual stories and accounts of concussions by athletes who had them at high school, college, and, and uh, professional level, and um, has been, I think, a very um, good way of promoting some of the problems with concussion and some of the myths about it. Over 20 years ago, we got involved with doing some guidelines, and I won't bore you with going through them in great detail, but in 1986, there were no guidelines for returning to contact sports. And so although this paper is perhaps best known for doing a grading scale of concussion, and I'll comment a little bit about that in a minute, um, it really was to written predominantly to give um, guidelines for when it's safe to allow athletes to return to contact collision sports. And when it was written over 20 years ago, it was really all empiric based on personal experience and knowledge of the literature to that date, but it wasn't prospective studies. We now, over the last 20 years, have a lot of prospective data. And I'll give you an overview of a lot of consensus statements which have happened, especially in the last 10 years, but the most important message and the take home is that no athlete symptomatic from a concussion belongs on the athletic field. Nobody who's symptomatic from a concussion should be taking further trauma to their head. In fact, just being physically active below, above just baseline levels may well aggravate their symptoms and may slow and retard their recovery. So the most mild concussions, we have individuals out for a week uh, during which time they're to be asymptomatic, first at rest and then with exertion as well. And then as the concussion severity goes up a bit, um, the length of time that somebody is recommended to be out uh, increases. So the most severe concussions, the grade threes, uh, an individual is recommended to be out a full month, the last week of which they must be asymptomatic at rest and exertion. I'm happy to go into this in greater detail with questions later. When these original guidelines um, 
came out, they were felt to be bare minimums. That, and if any physician wanted to be more conservative than this, um, certainly I wouldn't have any argument with that. And it's kind of fun that, that over the last 20 years there's been a cycle because in general, for most of the last 20 years, people have been less conservative than that week of being asymptomatic at rest and exertion. And now the cycle's kind of swinging the other way because there are electrophysiologic studies and diffusion tensor weighted image MRI studies, very sophisticated MRI studies, that suggest maybe we need to even be asymptomatic longer uh, than a week. Um, we understand a bit of the physiology of concussion now. Admittedly, most all of this is in animals, not in humans for obvious reasons. But what it really metabolically involves is a mass release of neurotransmitters as the brain is shaken violently inside the skull. The word concussion is from the Latin word concussus, and it means to shake violently. And that's literally what happens to the brain. It's inside the skull. It's a little smaller than is the interior surface of the skull. And when you have a blow to the head or an indirect blow that snaps the head back, a blow to the chest will snap the head forward, a blow to your Posterior thorax will snap your head back, typical whiplash thing. You heard that from car accidents. You can be concussed by whiplash alone. It takes a much more violent blow to do it than a direct contact with a head, but you can have it by indirect uh, as well. And what happens is you have a mass exodus of potassium out of cells, a mass um, uh, uh, egress of calcium into nerve cells, into nerve fibers, neither which should be there, meaning in the extracellular space, or in this case, intracellularly. It shuts down the normal metabolism of the uh, brain cell, and the brain cell now is massively trying to pump the calcium out and get the potassium back in. It's all happening during a period of time when there is a diminishment of cerebral blood flow, and essentially all this sets up a metabolic crisis that lasts for the better part of a week. And therein is why we still, to this day, uh, think about the advantages of being asymptomatic for a week because we know, at least in animal work, all of this metabolic uh, disruption uh, is something that isn't uh, reversed within 24 hours. We also know that if you have a concussion, and you don't have any secondary insult, most individuals are going to be completely asymptomatic at some point or going to have complete recovery. On the other hand, if you have a secondary insult, while the brain is still recovering, that can lead to cell death. These are the types of, of intracranial insults or secondary insults that happen with more severe brain injuries, increased intracranial pressure, loss of autoregulation, anoxia, ischemia. But this is the secondary insult that we don't want to see our athletes have, meaning a second head injury. So athletes really should be asymptomatic for a week at rest and exertion before going back uh, following a cerebral concussion. The um, grandfather of really all neurosurgery involvement with head and spine athletic injuries was Richard Snyder, a chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery at Michigan, who published a lot in the early 1950s in such things as that great medical journal called Life Magazine. But um, seriously, he was very interested in head and neck injuries at a point in time when the incidence of fatalities due to head and spine injury in football was going up because a face mask was put on the helmet. And now because the face mask was on the helmet, the, the helmet began to be used as a weapon in blocking and tackling. This is what we never want to see, and fortunately most doctors will never see in their career because it doesn't happen very often. 
if an individual is, this is the one sport where it's happened many times in the same contest. Most boxers who die in the ring, unfortunately, don't die really from the subdural blood clot that often is there, but they die from massive brain swelling, brass, brain edema. You can take the clot out, but the brain edema is very tough to treat. And it's individuals that took a tremendous amount of punishment uh, in the ring in a given fight. This is the one sport where you tend to have the second impact syndrome occur in the same contest, although I think we've seen it in football as well. And what is it? It's really an individual who has an initial brain injury who, while they're trying to recover from that brain injury, has a second injury. And the second one can be pretty minor. And there's a loss of autoregulation of blood flow. Blood flows into the head faster than it can get out. It leads to massive increase in intracranial pressure. And these individuals go from an awake, alert state to a comatose state uh, in a very short period of time. This condition has a very high mortality rate approaching 50 percent, morbidity rate nearly 100 percent. Very few people recover without some neurologic um, disability from this problem. Fortunately, it's not real common. What most commonly happens is that an individual like Jimmy, who has a concussion and then picks up a second one before they've recovered from the first one, has additive effects, that secondary insult situation. And one and one don't equal two, they equal five or seven or nine. It's an exponentially worse situation. Confucius is right. To know what you know and to know what you don't know, that is knowledge. But when we look at statistics, as I was trying to tell young James tonight, while they don't necessarily lie, they don't necessarily tell the truth either. And you have to know what goes into whatever the data set is to honestly know whether you can believe it or whether it's very skewed because of the way the information was accumulated. For instance, this is the incidence of concussion in a slew of medical papers that pretty well represent uh, what sideline team physicians see, sideline certified, medic, uh, certified athletic trainers see. This is in the sport of football, the incidence of concussion anywhere from three to seven, eight percent. But if you do a different study and you wait till the season is over, so none of the factors Peter was alluding to were brought into play, and you, you sit your athletes down and you say not how many concussions have you had, but how many of you have had these post-concussion symptoms over the course of the last season? The statistics go as high as 70 percent. And so where is the real incidence? Well, it's probably somewhere in between because probably not all of these people really re uh, remembered things perfectly accurately. Uh, but clearly, the incidence of concussion in football is far higher than those of us on the sideline recognize because people play through it all the time, the minor ones, and it's not just football, it, it's in all the collision sports. This is a very famous study by Gerberich in 1983, and he actually, or she actually, um, neuropsychologist, made the point. Um, in this particular paper, the incidence of concussion was 2.4 percent. but if instead of how many concussions you've had, you just ask the question, how often have you had loss of consciousness, loss of awareness, dizziness, headache, blurred vision, double vision, the incidence was almost 20 percent. So this paper a long time ago really told the story that a lot of data and a lot of studies have confirmed through the years. Now how does this happen? Why does this happen? Well, obviously, if an athlete has loss of consciousness, a seizure, loss of balance, or syncope falls over, collapses, everyone's going to know they've had an issue. But all of these other post-concussion symptoms are probably going to be only known by the player themselves, especially if that player is playing a sport like football 
where they're wearing all kinds of equipment, their faces are all covered up with masks, they have helmets on their head, they're 40 yards away, the game is more stop than go, so you can kind of recover for 30 seconds for the next four seconds of activity, as compared, for instance, with soccer, which is a continuous sport, always moving. If somebody's stumbling around and lost their balance in soccer, you'd know about it. Football, you may not. So when we say the incidence of concussion is 10% in a lot of studies in soccer, that's probably a pretty close to realistic figure. Whereas when we say the incidence of concussion in football may be 6 8%, that's probably way under reporting and kind of showed you the, the data. Now, why do people play through their injuries? Um, Peter gave you the example of one of them, certainly. But this is from a paper of McRae. 66% thought that the injury wasn't all that serious. 41% didn't want to leave the game. Um, others didn't know it was a concussion. And then clearly didn't want to leave, let the teammates down, culture of playing through. Ted Kennedy calls him uh, Manny Sosa. Uh, in any event, he um, had a pretty severe concussion when that baseball shattered his batting helmet and his home run production precipitously fell off. And it was all attributed to the fact he couldn't take steroids anymore, which was true that he couldn't take steroids anymore legally. Probably hadn't been taking him that whole year either. But his home run production probably fell off for Sammy Sosa much more because of this concussion. And after being out of baseball a whole year, he came back last year and for an old guy performed reasonably well. Baseball was the sport that we played at the University of California, Berkeley. And I'm really proud to say that the Cal Bears went to the College World Series in Omaha, Nebraska the year before I went to Cal. <laughs> But I did have my moment of glory. Oh, yeah. No, actually, that's Jorge Cantu from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. All right, well, Jimmy already indicated the problem with concussions is you can't see it. Obviously, you all can see this guy, this Pittsburgh Steelers, got a problem with his feet. One of them's going the right direction, but obviously the other isn't. So you don't have to be a genius to know there's a problem. Concussion isn't so easy to necessarily know unless, as in this case, someone's unconscious. There are no biological markers of concussion, though there are markers we do look for of brain injury in general. Um, it is a clinical diagnosis. Um, it's recognized only a fraction of the time in certain sports, especially sports where it involves a lot of stop and go and a lot of equipment that covers people up. And then even the best of scientific studies, and we've kind of been involved with a lot of good people that have done both these types of works. When, you, when you've got a really tightly controlled study, because it's only done in one or two schools, and everybody's on board in terms of how you're diagnosing things and, and treatment protocols and so on, you get really good data, but it's pretty sparse. There's not a lot of it. And then you get involved with big studies like NC2A studies with a lot of athletes, thousands of individuals involved, but a lot of schools, a lot of different people doing the assessments, a lot of interpretations that aren't exactly on the same page no matter how much you try to make them. And so all the studies that are done really have some inherent biases one way or the other. Um, in the last year we kind of put together for the journal Neurosurgery an editorial on this problem, we went through essentially where all of the consensus statements have brought us to this point today. And one of the first ones that was put together uh, was a lot of years ago in 1979. Um, this was the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine. And out of that particular meeting came guidelines for concussion management. This is the most recent one. Uh, from St. Moritz, uh, Switzerland, um, or Sam Moritz. The in between were international concussion uh, uh, consensus statements that came out first in Vienna in 2001 and then Prague 2004. Um, 
And each of these um, conferences had their proceedings published uh, in a trio of journals at the same time um, and the recommendations. And some of the recommendations that came from the writing group is that concussion severity should only be determined after all signs and symptoms have cleared, the individual has become neurologically normal, cognitive function is returned to baseline. That loss of consciousness, where it may be associated with some early cognitive deficits on the day of the brief loss of consciousness, generally speaking, it's not correlated with concussion severity. And therefore, one of the major uh, grading scales out there really doesn't stand the test of time. Uh, this is a little bit um, underappreciated, I think, by perhaps um, much of the population. Um, and fortunately, our, our pediatricians, I think, are pretty keen on this, generally speaking. Somebody's recovering from a concussion. You've got brain cells in metabolic crisis. What you want to do is rest them. In an ideal world, you do no more physical activity than walking. And the only reason you walk from the brain standpoint is because the rest of your body goes to pot if you don't. And it's horrible for your body to be in bed and not be weight bearing and so on. But no more physically active than walking. If you are physically active, um, you may provoke more symptoms. You will retard recovery. But in an ideal world, the same thing for cognitive activity is also there. You wouldn't ask young people to be stressing their brains while recovering from a concussion. And if a person has severe post-concussion symptoms, a number of them, we limit the amount of time they can study to being under whatever doesn't worsen those symptoms, and if that means not at all, then they can't study at all. And they may not be able to continue that particular semester if you've kept them at reduced activities and you've never been able to lengthen it back for them to catch up. So this concept of cognitive rest as well as physical rest um, is uh, something I think the pediatricians recognize perhaps better than some other uh, medical specialties. One of the most important things coming out of that particular uh, consensus statement is that the number, the duration, and the severity of total post-concussion symptoms uh, is what defines truly the severity of a concussion. So an individual that has symptoms that are lasting months, that is obviously much more severe a concussion than somebody who had symptoms that lasted for 24 hours or, or a day or two. We've already talked about the cognitive rest. Uh, in an ideal world, we would return kids to school when they're asymptomatic. This isn't an ideal world. If the symptoms aren't too severe, we try to get them back in school and functioning, but not asking them to take exams, certainly not lengthy exams, studying under levels where they're not aggravating their symptoms. And that's something that's normally uh, worked out uh, with the school uh, system and the teachers. Neuropsychological assessment post-concussion is definitely of value, especially uh, it's much more sensitive looking at the cognitive part of the neurologic exam, but it is only one piece of the concussion puzzle, um, and it never should be used as the sole criteria in terms of red light, green light, whether you're ready to go back or not. And unfortunately, um, it, it can sometimes be misused that way. These are the way they can be administered. Paper and pencil tests have been there for decades. But today, because of the fact that it gives you reaction times, it can be done quickly in 15, 20 minutes, infinite variations of the theme, so the learning effect is a little bit minimized. The computerized test batteries are what are used. Impact and Headmind are the two most common ones used. Cogsport's bigger in Australia where it was devised and uh, has one advantage. It uses basically playing cards and memorizing things on them. 
So it's really kind of a language neutral situation. So if you have a population that doesn't particularly, is not particularly fluent in English, Cogsport becomes a, a test battery that uh, has some particular appeal. Uh, tremendously useful statement came out from the National Athletic Trainers Association regarding concussion, very comprehensive. American College of Sports Medicine has weighed in on this. This um, diagram is something, cartoon really, is something that I think is really very important and maybe is the fourth or fifth of the takeaway messages tonight I hope that you will have. And that is simply think above the clavicles if you have any neurologic symptoms suggestive of spinal cord or brain injury, you cannot play safely. Below the clavicle, you may have symptoms of injury and you may be able to safely play depending upon what the nature of the muscular, the skeletal, uh, the osseous injury is. But if you've got spinal cord symptoms, you've got brain symptoms, you, you should not be participating in a sport activity. Um, this is the revised grading system that we came out with in 2001. And it's pretty complicated, and, and I'm, for the purposes of the majority of you here, what's important to understand is simply that a mild concussion, there's no loss of consciousness, and if there are symptoms, they clear up pretty quickly within 30 minutes. And that's going to be a, a fairly high percentage of athletic concussions. The intermediate grade is when there was either a very brief period of unconsciousness or you had amnesia that was over 30 minutes but under 24 hours or you had post-concussion symptoms that lasted days but less than a week. The third or severe concussion, and this is the group that's out a month, these two groups are out a week after they become asymptomatic. So if, if it takes them a week or two to get asymptomatic, pardon me, if it takes them a day or two to get asymptomatic, the clock starts for that week of being asymptomatic at rest and exertion whenever they are asymptomatic at rest and exertion. But it's a one week of that and they're back for either of these two grades. This one, they're out a month. The last week of that, they must be asymptomatic at rest and exertion. If they become asymptomatic, on week two, for instance, that then they would just still have to be out a month. They, may, they would be asymptomatic for several weeks before they're back. This group almost always gets into that severe concussion group, not because of loss of consciousness over a minute, because we almost never see it in athletics. It happens, yes, but it is very rare. We see it all the time with high-speed motor vehicle accidents and motorcycle accidents and so on, but on the athletic field, this is rare. People get into the severe grade almost always because post-concussion symptoms lasting greater than a week. I see a very skewed population of people with concussions. I don't normally see this group at all. I see some here, um, but I see an awful lot here, and it is uh, quite um, eye-opening to realize how many young boys and girls and, and men and women wind up with post-concussion symptoms that go on months and some of them that go on uh, even for a much more extended period of time. Anybody who's assessing concussions needs to, I think, keep this in mind. All of these pieces of the puzzle need to be evaluated by the clinician they need to know the concussion history, how many, how close together they were. We're much more worried about concussions piled close together than we are concussion years or multi-years apart. But we still are interested in the total number. No, there isn't a magic number that three and you're out or five or whatever. It's an individual thing for each person. We want to know that the the symptom checklist, and I'll go through that in a second. The physical neurologic exam becomes part of it. We want to know the mechanism of the concussion and how severe the impacts were that caused it. And the neurologic exam 
which is very heavily weighted on cognition, and the cognition part of the neurologic exam is best tested with neuropsychological test batteries. It's a much more sophisticated way of doing it than what we otherwise use, which are like digits forwards, digits backwards, remembering words at zero and four minutes and things like that. In terms of the mechanism of injury, one of the things we're really keen on looking at is, did the blow cause you to expect a concussion to happen? Was it a minor blow that suddenly has produced very lengthy concussion symptoms, or was the blow quite uh, severe so you kind of expected big concussion symptoms? This past week, we happen to have seen a professional baseball player um, that uh, it currently plays for the Milwaukee Brewers who has been out of baseball since July of 2006 with a profound post-concussion syndrome. What is even more disconcerting and alarming, though, is that when you look at the video of his concussion, he actually was going back for a flare. He's a third baseman. He's going back for a flare, and he falls down on, the, on his back, and he whiplashes his head, but he doesn't have any direct head contact. And that gave him post-concussion symptoms that have been very profound in how long they've lasted. Um, that worries me, at least, much more than somebody that really conked heads hard with somebody else, and you'd say, how could they not have a concussion? This is the checklist that uh, reflects the 25 most common post-concussion symptoms. Those in um, yellow are the most common of the post-concussion symptoms. I'm sorry, this is not projecting perfectly on that screen. Uh, can't help that. The, um, all 25 need to be looked for, and the way I look for them is we have the kids when they come in or the adults fill out the checklist of the 25 symptoms and they grade them from one to three and how severe they were when they had each of their concussions, how long they lasted, and then how many symptoms they have on the day that they see me. And based on all of that, we arrive at how severe the concussion was um, and the workup and the battery that goes beyond. But it's very important that um, physicians that are seeing athletes for a concussion have this checklist or a checklist of post-concussion symptoms. You can't remember all these things on the top of your head and, and you undoubtedly forget it. So the easy way to do it, I think, is to have the athletes themselves fill it out, then go over it with them carefully. Preferably with a, if it's a youngster, a, a parent or parents present. Um, when should an athlete retire? An athlete should retire when they have post-concussion symptoms that don't clear. If an individual has symptoms referable to their brain, they can't play a contact or collision sport. But the other situation that happens, beside the obvious one like that, is individuals who may have had post-concussion symptoms that last a long period of time, and what provoked them is a very minor hit. That's kind of the, the gray zone, but the thing that's telling uh, me that this individual um, should not take further concussions because they may not ever recover from those symptoms. So we don't let anybody go back who's still symptomatic. We recommend that individuals give up a sport if they have a history of concussion that they recover from quickly and then they suddenly don't recover and what caused it is a very minor blow. Imaging for concussions, whether it be a CT or an MRI, is usually done if we don't see symptoms clearing up quickly or if we suspect an intracranial bleed may also be present. But from the standpoint of the concussion itself, you're not going to see any abnormalities on an MRI uh, or on a CT, a standard um, film. Most NFL fans now know that concussions can easily become a geometric problem. That is that a 
Player's susceptibility to his next concussion increases with his last one, and the effects years afterwards are just now being analyzed. One study suggests that three concussions make a player three times more likely than the general population to develop depression or the symptoms of early Alzheimer's. Somebody who's had more concussions is a greater risk for brain problems from subsequent concussions. Dr. Robert Cantu is the chief of neurosurgery at Emerson Hospital. In at least this group of retired NFL players that took the trouble to fill out the questionnaires and return them regarding their concussion history that those that had three or more concussions when compared with a group that didn't have any concussions there was a five times greater incidence in mild cognitive impairment uh, which is really thought of as not yet dementia but on the way to it um, three times greater incidence in recent memory impairment and three times greater incidence of depression so it suggests here that three is some kind of a magic number. I can tell you from personal experience it's not. I've seen a lot of athletes with over 10 concussions and they're doing fine. And I've seen some athletes, I can remember one youngster who lost a whole school year with his first concussion. Actually, it was his second. Similar, it was similar to Jimmy. Um, he wound up having a concussion. It wasn't recognized. While still symptomatic, he got a second one. That one caused him to go from September to June not remembering the names of his classmates, basically not being able to do uh, mathematics that he'd already mastered up to that point, and very severe Im uh, impairments with uh, words. Eventually, a light bulb kind of went off for him in, uh, later in June after school had let out. He lost that whole school year, and by the following September, he was doing reasonably well, though not quite where he was before. Well, for him, those two concussions are all I'll ever give him in any kind of collision sport. I'd never recommend that youngster go back to, it. in his case, it was football. Um, many other individuals we've seen have recovered very nicely from a, from a quite high number of concussions. I'm not saying that um, it's good to get 10 concussions. I don't want anybody to have 10, but some people seem to have been able to do it and do, do well. So it's an individual thing. But Mike Webster was the first um, individual that became part of a now series of five individuals that have been looked at um, in terms of their brains for traumatic encephalopathy. Um, he became the first paper in neurosurgery about traumatic encephalopathy in an NFL player. Um, Terry Long is the second player that was, his brain was studied. These individuals all shared a triad of having cognitive impairment, depression, and emotional ability, very uh, erratic emotional behavior. Um, I think you're all pretty well aware of an individual locally here who brought his story public uh, in a quite courageous way, I think, this past January, um, trying to make uh, others in the NFL aware of his problems with his particular uh, situation. Um, you probably heard the story told, but his, his problem kind of came to a head when he was concussed in a game on Sunday and then on Thursday before the next game he'd been what they call red shirted all week long meaning he had the red jersey on the, the medical staff had said he couldn't take any contact and then on this particular uh, day the coach of the team kind of I think not understanding the uh, what he knows today, and I don't think with any evil intention, just wanted to know, can this guy suit up and play on Sunday? So his way of finding out was to take the red jersey off, put the blue one on, and run a fullback at him, and basically on a five-on-five -five drill, and he's the middle linebacker, and he's got to stop him. And he did with his head, and uh, received a very severe, worse post-concussion syndrome, from which he's never recovered. Uh, to this day. He has other issues as well, but um, it's a profound post-concussion 
syndrome that is uh, very disabling to him to this day. In a number of other professional um, sports, uh, steeplechase jockeys in England where they jump the uh, hedges, so to speak, and uh, fall at an alarming rate and get head injuries at an even more alarming rate. The incidence of traumatic encephalopathy is quite uh, replete in the literature. Uh, boxing certainly has contributed to the greatest number of individuals that have been studied with this condition, but as you can see, um, a number of other sports where head trauma uh, occurs um, uh, are now uh, with cases in the literature. And this past year we um, did another editorial, in this case, on the cases of traumatic encephalopathy in the NFL. Well, Larry, prior to uh, Chris Benoit's brain being examined by Sports Legacy Institute, uh, four prior brains had been looked at and all four of them had chronic traumatic encephalopathy, brain damage due to concussive and cumulative subconcussive brain injuries. All four of these were in National Football League players. Um, Chris Benoit's brain was similarly studied by the neuropathologist within the Sports Legacy Institute, Dr. Bennett Amalo, with the special immunohistochemical stains that look for abnormal tau protein deposition. Professional wrestling is a sport, obviously, in which the outcome is predetermined. Um, but it's a sport in which these athletes are performing much more difficult stunts than they were 25, 30 years ago. And they're really doing it kind of without a safety net because they don't have a medical team that's with them. And these athletes are booked night after night in different cities. Um, the show must go on. When these athletes get a concussion, get stunned, that's when they then really set themselves up to be badly hurt because now their timing is off and now a blow that's supposed to look like a punch turns into a real punch. But even without all of that, you can see the whiplash effect of some of the stunts that Chris Benoit was doing over his more than 25 year career. Jumping off 12 foot ladders onto the uh, apron, even if you miss the individual <laughs> Uh, and cushion so you don't really hit him, you're jarring the son of a gun out of your brain. And this is a picture of a normal brain and normal brain cells, hematoxin and eosin stain, and, and that's nice, healthy brain tissue. And this is Chris Benoit's brain where tau protein, a hyperphosphylated type, is this is neurotoxic. It kills nerve cells. It destroys axons and dendrons that go in between nerve cells. His brain had the most extensive deposits of this tau protein of any of the five individuals, as I indicated, the other four were NFL players, um, that had been studied to date. Um, just simply again showing his brain compared with a normal brain. We're on the verge, I hope, of understanding what the actual forces are producing concussion, but every time we think we know something, um, we realize how much more there is for us to fully understand. Over the last couple years, accelerometers have been available to be put into helmets, and with a telemetry system, you can sit on the sideline at your computer and actually have a printout of each hit and, and what were the g-forces that occurred from that hit. And what we thought we were going to see, based on some theoretical data, is that at around 100 G force, we're going to see everybody concussed. And we don't. What we see is that some individuals on a given day may be able to withstand a force of 100 G or 120 G, and then another 80 G and be OK and then a fourth or fifth hit at 60 G is the one that causes the concussion. So is it a single level? Probably not. Is it cumulative and within a certain period of time? Probably, at least for some uh, individuals. And so these are some of the research questions that are being worked on today and probably going to be solved by some of the people, hopefully someone from Concord Carlisle High School as they go through their career in the future. Is there an acceleration tolerance level for concussions? 
We thought there was. It probably isn't that simple. What are the other factors that modulate this tolerance level? Impact location, concussion history, number, proximity, severity, number of subconcussive blows an individual may have sustained on the same day or in the past, plane position, age. All of these factors probably uh, play a role. Um, does, does the clinical outcome correlate with impact severity? It certainly doesn't one-to-one, -one, at least by what we know today. What is the impact exposure versus the athlete's exposure? Um, in other words, what's more important, that one impact or what that individual took over the course of a game or a practice and what that individual may have taken over the course of a career? All of these things may play uh, significant roles that we need to have answers for. Improving concussion outcomes will require greater education and awareness for players, coaches, and parents. And that's where Brooke DeLynch uh, is one of the pioneers with getting this information to parents about concussions in a lay book that was uh, to the lay audience, but had very, very appropriate information in it. Teaching proper technique, and this goes mostly to the coaches, and uh, uh, they need to be informed about taking the head out of the initial part of contact in football. We need a cultural change, and if the NFL is, is I think, Commissioner Goodell kind of boldly stepped up to the platter a few weeks ago, it's only a beginning, it's not the answer, but at least he said we are going to penalize flagrant helmet-to-helmet -helmet hits. And if the NFL can do it, certainly the college level has got to step in line and, and high school below it. Um, we need to develop more and more objective measures of brain injury. The particular markers that we use today are not as specific as we would like them to be. They're not as sensitive as we would like them to be. Um, and with that, I thank you very much. And I also want to thank Tina for giving me the chance to speak with you tonight. James. Until Peter throws this out, we will take your questions. The incidence in soccer is 10% per season. Per season. Per season. And this is, with, this is mostly coming from NC2A data and some studies that are beginning to focus on high school data as well. The NC2A has been pretty well studied. That's a much higher rate than people thought, but it's been consistent now for about five years. Um, it is, however, probably a pretty true incidence of concussion for the reasons we indicated. You can't play soccer and be concussed like you can try to stumble through uh, some other sports. I think the best I can say is that there is no evidence that I'm aware of that playing soccer through the collegiate level causes any problems short of individuals that may have a concussion history within the sport. So that heading the soccer ball, the exposure that you would get up through collegiate sports has not been shown to be detrimental. There are some studies in professional sports of individuals that have played at the professional levels 10 years and also therefore would have had more than 10 years at, uh, at lower levels. And at the professional level, they practice heading for 30 minutes to an hour a day. Um, that suggested these soccer players didn't perform well in one set of studies. It was neuropsychological testing in others. It was EEGs, which is not a very good way to measure brain uh, issues in this field, meaning concussion injury, because it's normally not very sensitive. Those studies were not controlled. There may have been other behaviors that explain that particular problem, but I think it's fair to say it's an open-ended question. Um, it could be that heading the soccer ball for a long enough period of time can cause in susceptible individuals some, some issues. But I'm not aware of any study that's ever shown it to occur up through collegiate soccer. Question for Jimmy along the line here, too. No, that would be an interesting study uh, to be done. Uh, they would have to helmet the soccer player to, to do the study, but it certainly could be done just from the scientific standpoint. 
As an individual who's seen a lot of soccer players that have been concussed, I've never seen a soccer player concussed from hitting the ball alone that I've been convinced that was it. I have seen soccer players concussed from a ball kicked at a fairly close distance of a few feet. Jimmy's doing very well in school and uh, will go on, I'm sure, to a very fine college career. And he shifted his sporting activities to tennis, which I highly advocate. <laughs> um, with regard to um, post-concussion syndrome, there are a number of athletes who have had their careers terminated because of persistent symptoms. Um, they're not, you know, for every famous one you can think of, there, there are hundreds and hundreds who you've probably never heard of. But the bottom line is that, roughly speaking, 15 to 10 to 15 percent of individual with an athletic concussion will get over it within a week. 15, 10 to 15 percent, the symptoms will last longer than a week. The vast majority of those will clear within a month. Those that go beyond a month, maybe anywhere from one month to six months to a year, and then a very small percentage under one percent will have persistent symptoms, never recover. It's, it's uncommon for those individuals to wind up in that group from their first concussion, like that youngster I indicated, um, and, and uh, W.B. lives in the area, and his dad and he have gone very public with all of this because his dad was his coach who didn't recognize the issues. And almost certainly he wouldn't um, ha have had the issues were it not those two happened so close together uh, while he was still symptomatic. Yeah, definitely because um, you can, I uh, myself, because I've spoken to a couple different schools, you know, mainly high schools, because, I mean, no offense, but I can, I can get along, you know, with kids, because kids, you know, they're going to listen to you no matter what, and they're going to watch and try to learn about what you're saying, but if you can relate to someone that's your age or it's common sport, then you're almost like, oh, okay, yeah, this kid has kind of something interesting to say. I might as well listen, you know, and uh, I think it hits home more if they see, you know, someone their age or, you know, something that they can relate to. Yeah, you both couldn't be more right on. Uh, Jimmy and I recently uh, spoke at Woburn High, and uh, it was kind of a mixed audience, but they, there were a lot of athletes, in, unlike tomorrow, where it's going to be pure student body. Um, and after the perfunctory questions from the parents, and, you know, most of them directed to the doc, whatever, um, there was a plight good night, bet, 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 and then Jimmy went out and they all came up to Jimmy, <laughs> the kids, because they wanted to talk to him and uh, exactly what you're saying, and he does relate very, very well. Yes, sir? I don't know, yeah, I don't know how many years ago this was. The ball gene is really not a part of concussion. It may or may not have been a part of pain and, and experiencing violent headache, that kind of thing. Um, the getting them up at night um, was so that you were sure that he could be aroused to awakened state and wide awake and alert. Um, ironically, we were asked this very question uh, today um, in terms of why do you still have people awakened at night because you know that sleep deprivation is bad for concussion. You know you want these youngsters to get as much sleep as they can, et cetera. And today, for cost-effective reasons, virtually all these kids, have, almost all of them, have been CAT scanned already, and you, you know they don't have an intracranial hematoma, at least one that showed. But, and then they go home with a head sheet, and the head sheet says, wake them up three or four times during the night. Well, the reason why you still do it that first night is because CTs may not show a small bleed early on, or you may get it so soon that it's really not there yet. And so those of us that are neurosurgeons have all had experiences with subdurals that weren't there day one within an hour of an incident or an hour and a half, and yet we're there the next day. So just because a CT is normal, the night some kid comes in within 30 minutes or an hour of his injury, it doesn't mean he doesn't have a subdural. It means he doesn't have one that shows at that time. And so you still go to the trouble to wake him up just to give you that extra safety. But beyond that first night, generally speaking, you want to let the youngsters get as much sleep as they possibly can. Yes, sir? The, uh, 
Yeah, it tested out in terms of all the hits, which include six standard hits and then random hits for a total of 10. Tested out with a severity index at 370, roughly, which is hugely better than uh, the current technology using the uh, uh, polystyrene inner energy attenuating systems in the heart. It, the same hard outer polycarbonate shell is in this uh, Zenith helmet, but the, the cushioning are these air uh, uh, compressible uh, air cells. Um, there were many, many locations where the hits were under 200, though, in terms of the recording. So it, it was hugely better than anything that's been tested so far. But that's testing it in the lab. Now that helmet's got to get on the athletic field, and it needs to be tested over the course of a season. Will, after thousands of hits, it still be that good? And if it is, and I have no financial involvement with this company, but if it is, I would predict that technology will be used in everything from bicycle helmets to NASCAR boards to hockey board. Anytime you want to attenuate energy, whether it be in the military for protective equipment, um, it, it's lighter than any other existing materials and it really so far seems to work better. Um, there are several different schools that are using it right now, and there is a football league called the All-American League or something like that that plays in the spring, and that league, uh, I'm told, uh, will be using it. If it comes through all of that next fall, uh, it'll, be, it'll be on the market. There is one theoretical advantage to, to a mouth guard. What a mouth guard does, form-fitting, full bite is it opens the teeth slightly apart. If you open your jaw a little bit, put your hands right back here and feel your occipital condyle rotate down. It comes away from the base of the skull a few millimeters. So if you took a blow directly to the point of the chin, you've got two extra millimeters before your condyles ram into the base of the skull. So there's a theor th theoretical basis where if you took a blow right here, it may give you some protection to have that mouth guard in. The reality is that almost no blows in helmeted athletes come to the point of the jaw. They're almost all on the side of the head, the front of the head, the crown of the head, unfortunately, if you drop your head, which is now going to put you at risk of neck injury. So. Um, Mouth guards are not going to prevent almost all concussions. The one, I strongly recommend their, their use though, because they, they do two things. One, they protect the dentition quite well. And secondly, they give you something to bite on when you're about ready to get hit. And it's much better to be biting on some soft plastic um, or rubber than it is biting down on your teeth and risking chipping them and so on. My recommended process is the athlete come off the field and be assessed by the certified athletic trainer. If that is all the team's got, if the team has a doc as well, then the doc has worked it out with the athletic trainer, um, whether the athletic trainer is going to do the initial assessment and then when the individual is thought to be cleared, get the doc involved. But clearly that individual should come out. Whether that individual should ever be allowed back, no matter how quickly the symptoms clear or not, that, that's, there's a yin and the yang. The, the, if you're absolutely sure you know the individual, you've established a rapport with them because you're the athletic trainer that's there day in, day out, and you know that person, as opposed to the team doc who shows on Friday night and doesn't see anybody all week long, he really doesn't know, he or she probably doesn't know the players that well. Um, doesn't know whether somebody is acting a little different from their norm. Doesn't know whether a certain individual is prone to minimize symptoms or maybe even fib a little bit about whether they have them or don't have them. Um, so the safest thing, clearly, at the high school level is anybody that's recognized with a concussion comes out and doesn't go back into the same contest. 
And I would strongly applaud any doc and any certified athletic trainer that just did that. But it does come with a price, and the price is you may not get to see as many individuals because now they're going to hide them from you. Um, and it's not that hard to do with the minor concussions in football. And I would personally feel that um, I would not want to see that practice happening. And if that meant that you had to make some judgment calls, that maybe occasionally if, if you thought somebody really did have just simply very minimal symptoms and they truly cleared in five or ten minutes and they truly were asymptomatic, not just when you're examining them, but when you have them sprint up and down the sidelines, do some push-ups, sit-ups, and, and it doesn't provoke any symptoms, and they're neurologically fine, let some of those back in, I, I, I wouldn't find a problem with that either. But the safest thing to do, clearly, at the high school level is take no chances, take them out. Well, I don't, I don't really um, think we're asking too much because um, a certified athletic trainer has gone through the process to learn about head injuries, to know about concussion protocols. They've been trained in this. Believe it or not, um, not all physicians get that kind of training in their medical school curriculum. Today it's changing and it'll change, you know, I'm sure, more in the future, especially as the, um, uh, the, the profile of the minor, quote unquote, minor but yet life altering in, in instances. Um, head injuries become more fully appreciated. But I don't think tonight we can solve the issue of um, when a, a physician sees an individual sometimes removed from the scene. But I will say that if a physician had the information that the individual was presented acting the way you suggested on the field, I don't know how that person could come to that conclusion that there wasn't a concussion sometime later. But if the individual perhaps didn't have that information an hour later, an hour and a half, they're seen in a different setting, all this isn't well funded, funneled to them, and the individual seems fine at that point, they may come to a decision that uh, is, is not with complete information. Well, wh what, I, what I strongly believe in um, and what I've had discussions, for instance, with Brooke the Lynch for a number of years about is this information which we normally are preaching to a medical uh, choir, so to speak, um, needs to be given to the athletes, needs to be given to their parents. And yes, the, the parents and athletes together need to be proactive because only, only by this uh, everyone kind of being on the same page, recognizing what concussions are, recognizing the many symptoms of concussion, recognizing you shouldn't be taking more uh, physical activity, especially collision type activity while you're recovering from a concussion, recognizing even the cognitive stimulation may worsen post-concussion symptoms. All these are things that just doctors shouldn't know. Parents should know and, it, and in the sense of being proactive, giving this information to them, I think that's why Jimmy and I are here tonight.